praise the Lord. Good evening. Good evening, all of our viewers here on tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. Welcome to Shiloh Baptist Church Online Ministries. I'm Rob Chiefs, the senior pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church, Hodricks Corner, McLean, Virginia. To God be the glory. For all that he has done and continues to do, he has been blessing us on these two days. He blessed us on last night and looking forward to what he's going to do this evening through our messenger. Reverend Dr. William Curtis, Senior Pastor, Mount Eric Baptist Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh my goodness, if you missed last night, make sure you go back to the video library. Pull up last night's message. You've got to listen to that. Somebody ought to back me up and give me a witness and testify. And tell somebody, you better go get Monday night. Get, get, listen to Monday night's message. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's get ready for what God has in store for us tonight. Dr. Curtis prepared two messages for us. And Here's the final installation of this two-part series of the Empowerment Series. I pray tonight blesses your life. Again, Dr. Curtis, we do indeed great. We're grateful for this privileged opportunity that you can share with us in this season. So thank you so much for being who you are to the kingdom and certainly to this pastor and my family. God bless you, sir. All right, church, let's get ready to hear this second word and the closing word of this Empowerment Season. Start sharing it now. Tell everybody, tune in. Tune in. Get on YouTube. Get on Facebook, wherever you need to be. Quiet the hives down. Tell everybody, come around the TV, come around the mobile device. Come around the phones, tune in. Let's get this word and hear this word together. Y'all ready? Somebody ought to post, I'm ready for the word. Amen. Let's go on into the word. Hallelujah. God bless you. Love you guys. A native of Baltimore, Maryland, Reverend Dr. William H. Curtis accepted the call to ministry at the age of 17. Since 1997, he has served as the senior pastor at Mount Ararat. Baptist Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mount Ararat Baptist Church is a large urban ministry and ministers to more than 10,000 members in the community, providing four well-attended weekend services. Under the leadership of Dr. Curtis, the church implemented a community tithe program, which returns over 10% of the congregation's weekly offerings to small churches, parachurch ministries, and nonprofit organizations. Dr. Curtis has been an instructor at the United Theological Seminary and has graduated graduated several groups of doctoral students at the institution. Aside from pastoral instruction, he is co-owner of The Church Online, a successful technology and full-service marketing firm that provides top-of-the-line services to ministries all over the world. He is a board member of Amachi Pittsburgh, which I hope I've pronounced correctly. His board relationships include the Pittsburgh Sports and Exhibition Authority, the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, the Ellis School, the Interdenominational Theological Center, and the Baptist School of Theology. In addition, he served as president of the Hampton University Ministers Conference from 2007 to 2011. Dr. Curtis has been the recipient of numerous honors and awards. In 2009, he was inducted into the Martin Luther King Jr. Board of Preachers of Morehouse College. In the spring of 2010, Dr. Curtis moved from the speaking arena into the publishing arena with his first book, Faith, Learning to Live Without Fear, which is currently in its fourth printing. His second book, Dressed for Victory, Putting on the Full Armor of God, was released in April 2015. Dr. Curtis holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Religious Studies and Philosophy from Morgan State University, a Master of Divinity degree from Howard University School of Divinity, and a Doctor of Ministry degree from United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. Dr. Curtis is married to the former Christine Y. Richardson, and they are the proud parents of one lovely daughter, Houston. Shiloh, please give a warm welcome to Dr. William H. Curtis. To my little brother, the Reverend Dr. Robert Cheeks, and to the great members of the Shiloh Church in McLean, Virginia, I want to express my deep and abiding gratitude for the privilege that is mine to share the Word of God with you as you celebrate this worship opportunity. I know we're in the midst of pandemic times, but we thank God that we have this mode of, of communication the ability to share in virtual space. And so I pray that the Word of God will be a rich source of blessing in your life. Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 through 50, herein lies the Word of God. Again, 
The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet which was lowered into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, they dragged it up on the beach and they sat down and sorted out the good fish into baskets. But the worthless ones they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw the wicked into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping over sorrow and pain and grinding of teeth over distress and anger. I want to talk to you this weekend from the subject, sort it out, sort it out. You may be seated even in the presence of the Lord. In a private opportunity for ministry that is quickly shifting to attract wide public attention, Jesus invites his disciples to accept entering into the mystery of his ministry that ultimately we know is going to get him killed. God allows this to provide the gift of redemption to all who would believe in Jesus by faith. And to help provide a bridge of interpretation for these mysteries that include God's intent to bring everybody into the net of salvation and to make salvation about belief in his son by faith and not about the buckling weight of the law. Jesus discloses these mysteries in parables. And this one we settle on this weekend is a part of the trilogy that includes the parable of the wheat and tares that carries the instruction to let them both grow together until the gardener comes. Included is the parable of the treasure hidden in a field for which selling all you have is not unreasonable in order to go and buy the field just to possess the treasure. And then of course there is included the pearl of great price that upon finding it everything else is valued accordingly but nothing from here on out is valued as much as the pearl of great price. And of course Jesus is teaching the enormous and precious value of being graced into the kingdom of God the powerful salvation that makes that possible along with the level of surrender that is required to take advantage of this life altering conversion that ushers one into life in the kingdom of God. The parables are weighted in meaning. They provide wide windows of interpretation and they have life altering significance. No attachment greater than the attachment to Christ worth the sacrifice of everything, changing the outcome of all events and promising eternal security that is sure and guaranteed. That is the message. And while Jesus is sharing one parable after another, he tells this one. God's kingdom is like a fish net. One translation refers to it as a drag net cast into the sea. And when it is cast, it catches all kinds of fish. When the net is full, it is hauled onto the beach. The good fish are picked out and put in the tub. Those unfit to eat are then discarded. That's how it will be when the curtain comes down on history. The angels will come and cull the bad fish and throw them in the garbage. There will be a lot of desperate complaining, but it won't do any good. Well, mystery solved, right? God intends to make the kingdom available to all kinds of people who we won't know are good or bad until dragged to shore. The net of his intent is wide. The fish expected are indiscriminate. The separation will only take place once the net is pulled to shore. The meaning of the parable is clear about how the kingdom thinks about creation. But it is also clear about how the Lord intends the church to steward ministry. The church ought to toss a wide net 
to catch any kind of fish or person, distinguished and unique, diverse and peculiar. The church ought to drag that net over a wide expanse where the gospel is shared everywhere to anyone in hopes of winning all. And the church ought to trust that the activity on the shore is so thorough that it doesn't need to be attempted while the net is still in the water. Meaning, like the parable of the wheat and tares, there's a time for separating, and it's not while you are fishing. The parable is no doubt disclosing the kingdom. It is describing the church. But I want to submit to us this weekend that it is also detailing a life. In fact, it is detailing each one of our lives. It is disclosing the kingdom, it is describing the church, but it is also detailing a life. If you want a life that has deep meaning and rich value and wide significance, then toss a wide net. And this speaks, of course, to expectations, nurturing big dreams, making a big go at life, finding that spiritual mix between gift and the room made available because of your gift. If you're going to live life, make a big go at life. Don't desire a big life then and then only toss a small net. If you find that faith spot in your relationship with the Lord that makes you trust his push of your life out into the deep waters of lived human experience, if you trust him to take you way out there like that, then don't trust him to go that far out there and then getting out there toss a small net of personal attempt. Instead, drop a drag net and expend your energy to drag it across the water's bottom. And Jesus promises that you will catch all kinds of personal experiences. All kinds of encounters and exposures and introductions and amazements and attachments. It's almost to make you wonder why everybody doesn't toss the drag net out there, doesn't it? If the catch is that great, if the catch is that guaranteed, why doesn't everybody toss a wide net? If Jesus is that inviting and that providing, if he keeps these enormous promises, then why doesn't everybody surrender to his lordship and trust his leading and grow from his love? And I suspect that this parable gives us a challenging clue. And it is this. Some, unfortunately, only trust the small net and not the drag net because once you pull that large drag net in, you got to sit down and go through the painful process of sorting through the catch. Now, when it comes to the kingdom, God is going to do the sorting. When it comes to the church, Christ upon his return will do the sorting. But when it comes to the principle for personal lived experience, you have to do the sorting in your own life. Life is about more than casting and catching and dragging to shore. It is also about sorting. It's fun casting and anticipating. It's exhilarating catching and dragging successes and progressions to shore, isn't it? But it's painful. It's laborious. It's introspective. It is revealing to have to sit on shore and sort through what is caught up in the dragnet of our lived experiences. Finding out that the weight we dragged in is the result of catching what doesn't agree with our system and what might cause harm to our very lives. Here is what the Lord is inviting you to consider as you stand today in front of the open door of your next opportunities. Beyond this space, in your life, child of God, are wide and deep and varied opportunities, rich experiences, significant introductions, life-altering engagements. But that's not all that's in that net. In that net is also some deep pains and draining experiences and regretful introductions and injurious engagements and it all gets dragged to shore in your relationship with God and God said when you sit on shore you don't put your thumb in your mouth and sulk because in your net has been caught up some of these deep pains and draining experiences because I give you the power to sit down and sort it out I'm convinced 
that this is what makes some of us stay with that small net comfortable with a limited emotional catch in life living the small faith life and dreaming about things we would love to consider but never intend to chase because we don't want all that other stuff that gets dragged in with the catch that will need to be sorted out to distinguish the good from the bad but my friends, as much as you love God for giving you the desire to chase life that comes as you grow in him, you have to also trust that the Lord gives you the strength to sort through the complexities of your life so that you can distinguish between the things that have gotten caught up in the net of your personal experience. You not only have casting vision, you not only have catching grace, you not only have dragging strength, but you also have sorting endurance. I'll say it again. You not only have casting vision, you not only have catching grace, you not only have dragging strength, but you also have sorting endurance. You have the grace to catch the vision, steward the process, and sort through the wide range of emotions that comes with a relationship that needs to be managed, the gratitude for and regret sometimes of the same and this is all part of trying a drag net that is so widely out there that pulls so many kind of different fish in so here's the admonishment advance your life step outside your restrictive borders test that space out there that only faith can take you to since when you get out there eyes can't see it and ears can't hear it generate interest in testing the borders of what it means when you hear that nothing is impossible for your God including getting a camel through the eye of a needle but with all of that discerning and all of that excitement just know that it comes with the need for you to sit down and sort it all out I'm talking about sorting through ranges of emotions, sorting through your own complexities to find the spiritual meaning of such deeply painful experiences, sorting through the complexities of love and relationship, forgiveness and personal ambition versus discern, calling, sorting through the difference between ego and spirit urging. It can be time consuming. It can be spiritually confusing. It can be emotionally draining, but it's what maturing faith has to do. We got to throw a wide net. We got to drag in a heavy catch, and then we have to sort through what has gotten caught up in the net. This text teaches us that everything caught can't be kept. Everything caught can't be kept. Enjoy the sorting because it's only required because your net was full. There would be no need to sort through the wide net if when it was cast and pulled in, it caught little to no fish. The sorting is laborious. It is painful because the net when cast caught so many fish. And as strange as this sounds, the sorting through of so much in your life where you're trying to make sense out of all that you do that makes you so tired, all the complexity of relationships that keeps you on emotional edge, the weight of your personal responsibility, the ideas that keep you up at night, the hours required to try to get it all done before you sink emotionally, except that all this in your net is an indication of how rich your life is how full your life is don't desire a different life instead accept the responsibility that none of these voluminous experiences can be a part of my life unless I also accept the responsibility to sit on shore and sort it all out so settle in to the conviction that everything in your life that has been caught has been for your benefit. But everything caught can't necessarily be kept because it then can become a weight more than you can handle and more than what is helpful. It was okay when the net was catching whatever. 
But now that you've settled in a season where no casting is being done, it's time to determine what weight can't you carry after sorting through all that is there. I wish I had a praying church. So start sorting through it. Keep what provides value separate out what does not here's the principle it is spiritual retention and spiritual release that everything attached to my life doesn't have to stay attached that some things that are introduced to my life may be good for the introduction so that it can give me maturation but after i reach maturation i have to then learn that god has seasons for some things and when it's time for me to do the sorting i've got to sort it out and let God help me do the separating. Here's the point. You can't protect against some of what you catch. Because it's how the net of your life works. Are y'all listening to me? You can't protect against some of what you catch. In other words, as you're casting your net, hurt is going to get caught up in it. Disappointment is going to get caught up in it. Confusion is going to get caught up in it. A broken heart is going to get caught up in it. Disappointment is going to get caught up in it. Betrayal is going to get caught up in it. Anger is going to get caught up in it. Delusionment is going to get caught up in it. You can't help what gets caught up in your life because all these things come when you cast your net. You can't avoid some of what hits you emotionally and affects you relationally and impacts you physically. It's how your net is constructed. And the only way to catch good fish is to accept that your net also grabs fish that will need to be discarded. It's that whole idea of risking to love, knowing that it's also a guarantee of some pain. But the power of love that draws us inspires the sorting through to ensure that when faith, hope, and love endures, you too will testify that the greatest of these is love. The difference between the testimony you hear from one fisherman to the next is how they have embraced that part that requires you to sort through what has gotten caught up in your net it's separating the good from the bad but you have to do it because it comes with a journey towards human significance are you hearing me what will separate those who will emerge from this pandemic season ready to seize the God provided opportunities on the other side from those who will mourn forever the loss of this present age the separation is going to be along the same lines as this text not can you toss a big net not can you drag in a big catch but can you sort through what you caught so you steward getting rid of the weight you don't need and identifying value you want to give the rest of your life in terms of attention to because god doesn't let anything in your life take so much of you that there's nothing left to sort through let me say it again. God doesn't let anything in your life. Somebody say anything. God doesn't let anything in your life take so much of you that there is nothing left to sort through. See, this parable is funny to me because it mentions, watch it, no possibility of an empty net but only the warning of a diverse one. It's not mentioning the shock of throwing a dragnet out there and catching nothing, but the sorting that will have to be done through all the fish you're going to drag to shore. Here it is. If you trust Jesus, your life has no possibility of emptiness. I think that was one of those lap running express a shout back arching tongue speaking smile clap stomp a foot give a praise kind of expression if you trust jesus your life has absolutely no possibility of coming up on empty where the net of your faith is dragged in with no rich experiences no significant exposures no meaningful introductions in fact it is completely and diametrically the opposite if you trust jesus then the 
sure guarantee is that you need to get ready to sort through all of the rich and voluminous experiences you're going to have, the significant exposures, the meaningful introductions, the places God's going to take you, the stations God will plant you, the doors God will set you before, the healing and the anointing and the favor and the prayer answering that God is going to bless your life with because God doesn't let anything in your life take so much of you that there's nothing left of you to sit down and sort through. I don't care how hurt you've been. I don't care who ran rough shot over your emotions. I don't care how many times you tripped. I don't care how many mistakes you made. God leaves you enough left in the tank so you can sit down and sort through it for I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. You always have something left in order to do some sorting. I don't, I don't care how hurt. You, you, can, you can go through that net. You can go through that net. I'm done. You can go through that net no matter how tired you are, no matter how frustrated at this 100th attempt to get it right. And you yet have what it takes to sort it out. No matter how much it took from you, no matter what it required, God will never make you drag that net in, that catch in, without gracing you to have energy to sort through it. Now, somebody needs to hear this because I'm telling you that many of us, we give up way too soon rather than to examine what God lets us have after surviving so many potentially perilous experiences. And sometimes the beginning of your re-emergence to some sense of normalcy in life is for you to acknowledge that what I went through came after it all. What I went through had every intent to take everything I had. But the fact that what I went through had an intent to take everything I had, God made sure that I still had enough to sit down and make a choice. And my choice is this, I'm not letting that be the end of my tomorrow. Because greater is he, Lord help me preach, that is in me than he that is in the world. Now, many would prefer, I admit this, many would prefer to drag the whole net and try to act like volume equates to quality. And dragging it then for the rest of their lives with all this unnecessary heaviness. And they go around doing that because they expect to be applauded for carrying around such heaviness. No, that's wasted energy. It's robbing you of opportunities for which you need to have sorted through all this stuff in your net. There are certain levels the Lord wants to take you to, but you will have needed to sort through what's in your net right now. And here is the good news. God gives you everything you need to dig it up out of you, to pull it down in your mind, to confront it in your thinking, to emote it in your heart, to face it in your physicality. In other words, he gives you the capacity to sort it out. If we were sitting in a counseling session and you gave me your unending catalog of complaints and criticisms and pains and perplexities, you might get offended with me if my answer and response to you was, here it is, the Lord told me to tell you, get up from here after we pray and go sit down and sort it out, figure it out, wrestle it out, tease it out, wake up tomorrow and decide, I'm going to take the shovel of my ambition and I'm going to dig up this hard soil and 
overturn it and I'm going to plant some new seed. I'll be doggone if I'm going to let the enemy make me give up my future because I'm at this current place of human and emotional perplexity. The devil is a liar. I'm going to sort this thing out. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure out my experiences and decide how God mixed this into the pot and the reason I know I have a right to do it is because I know all things are working together for my good. Don't be afraid to sort it out. I'm done. Don't be afraid of it. Sort through it. Face what can't stay. Protect and preserve what needs to remain. It makes the effort worth it. It puts the work in perspective. It brings a sense of gratitude that the Lord would choose to be this good to you. You've carried some heavy weight, my brother. You've carried some heavy weight, my sister. And thank God he didn't let the weight you have carried stop you from sorting through what has gotten caught up in your life. And that the Lord gives you what you need to distinguish and discern what needs to remain versus what needs to be discarded. Sort through it, my friend, so you can find the deep meaning in and for your life. Sort through it so you don't live making mistakes in judgment and decision making because you refuse to do the hard work of sorting through what you caught. Calvin Miller reminds us of the fable of that little girl whose mother experienced tragedy, calamity, crisis, and her face was hideously scarred from an injury. As the little girl grew, made friends, gained her own identity, she became more and more ashamed of her mother's horrid appearance. As she walked down the street with her mother, she noticed people moving over to the far side of the street, crossing the street just to avoid having to look at her. Gradually, the girl found ways to avoid even being around her mother in public. Eventually, the girl grew, became an adult, married, moved to another town, and her lonely mama suffered financial setback and faced basic human hunger. Her daughter continued to ignore her even in such destitute personal circumstances. That is, until one day, the daughter discovered an old diary of her mother's and it described a horrible fire that swept through their house. The mother in the midst of the fire had rushed into the burning house, scooped up her daughter in her arms, ran back out, burning herself beyond belief. The truth then dawned on the girl that her mother's horrific scars came from saving her daughter's life. A new kind of shame raced through her heart and soul. She ran swiftly to her mother, threw her arms around her, what now appeared to be a beautiful face. And in tears, she expressed her gratitude for all the sacrifice her mother had given. A new love relationship controlled their lives from then on. Why am I telling you this story? Because everything that has gotten caught up in your net is ultimately for your good. This is exactly exactly how we have this cemented relationship with Jesus remember some when they peered upon Jesus did not like the ugliness of the scars in his hands or the scars on his brow or the gaping wound in his side so much so that the prophet had to describe him by saying for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground he has no form and no comeliness and when we see see him there is no beauty that we should desire him he was despised and rejected by men I feel like preaching a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him he was despised and we did not esteem him surely however he has borne our griefs he has carried our sorrows yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted but here's the part I like the reason I still have to express my love to him is because his scars 
bought my salvation uh, and his wounds uh, are the reason uh, I can embrace redemption uh, because he was wounded uh, for our transgression uh, and he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement uh, of our peace was upon him uh, and by his stripes uh, we are healed uh, have I got a witness here tonight uh, all I'm trying to tell somebody is toss your net uh, catch your fish uh, drag it to shore uh, and when you start sorting through it uh, if inside your net uh, you've got pain and sorrow that's all right uh, sew it in uh, to the fabric of your testimony and tell somebody through it all I learned to trust in Jesus through it all. I learned to trust in God. Have I got a witness here? I'm trying to free somebody so you can testify. I've had many tears and sorrows and I carry questions about tomorrow. I had times when I did not distinguish right from wrong, but in every situation did you hear what I said I said in every situation in my heartache in my shame in my mistakes in my trip ups in my mess up I can still testify that through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus and I've learned to trust in God how you still smiling why you still have joy why you giving God praise how can you live to worship with all you've been through with all you've endured with all you had to take with all you've had to absorb I'll tell you how I've done it because I cast the net I caught the fish I dragged it to shore and when I sat down and started sorting through it I could see how God was making what the enemy meant for evil and turning it around for my good say yeah I'm trying to quit y'all I swear I'm trying to quit you saw through it sit down and face your pain face your heartache face your struggle sort through it and see how God is turning it around for your good Say yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sort through it. Don't let the complexity of it make you stop searching for the value that God has invested in it. Because in the deepest of your sorrow, God has planted a song. He's put joy in some strange places. I'm, I'm telling you, many people keep tossing a small net because they don't want to go through the painstaking process of having to sort through a complex catch. So you know what they do? They close in and stay insular. They refuse to love again. Why? Because they got hurt the last time. They don't try for the big vision because it's going to cause them to have to expend too much energy and relationships may be in jeopardy. They got to change some loyalties. Because of the physical limitations, they limit themselves and they spend all of their lives making this statement, I got to be careful about what I do rather than to take that leap of faith to say with faith all things are possible with God. Are y'all, y'all listening to me? Cast, cast that dragnet. And make that big catch and drag it to shore. And then trust that God gives you capacity after all the expenditure of that energy and emotion 
He gives you capacity to sit down and sort through it, working it out. Scripture says for your good. I hope, I hope you get the seed of the message Jesus is trying to convey because this is what it means to be in the kingdom of God. This is why you and I don't get into theological debates with people who wonder why, if we are Christians, bad things still happen to us. You know why bad things happen? Because a wide net sometimes catches fish we had no intention of catching. But it's okay, because God doesn't let a bad catch take from us more than the capacity to sort it and make distinguishing separations between what remains and what has to be discarded. Tonight, my brother, my sister, this morning, my brother, my sister, this weekend, my brother, my sister, whenever you're viewing our stream, I want you to hear my heart because you are one prayer away from salvation. And I want you, wherever you are, to pray with me. And I want you to pray literally believing by faith that God hears and answers prayer. So come on and pray with me. God, I come in Jesus' name, and I want to cast a big net for a big catch so that my life might honor you. I confess that Jesus is Lord, and by faith, from that confession, I accept the gift of salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, my brother, my sister, if you prayed that prayer, literally, in this moment, you have given your life to Christ. You are saved, and we praise God for that. Praise the Lord. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. God, thank you for sending such a powerful message. Two messages, two nights, the Empowerment Series. God, you have blessed us indeed. Shallow, has the Lord not blessed your life? Wow. Please comment, share, let somebody know you got to hear this. You got to hear these messages that God has spoken directly to all of us via Dr. Curtis. Dr. Curtis, thank you. May the Lord pour back into you, anoint you afresh for all the assignments he has in front of you, ahead of you, um, and that he is preparing to use you for. Thank you for blessing us tonight, letting God use you. Thank you for your obedience, sir. Thank you for these two nights of life-changing messages to help steer us in the right direction. Give us that push. You have literally become, been that catalyst that God is using us to help us onward and close this year out as strong as best we possibly can. Shallow, let's keep on pressing, but there's somebody here God spoke specifically to to draw them into a relationship. Let's encourage somebody tonight. Make sure everybody has received that relationship, that love relationship that is real and personal through Christ Jesus. If somebody needs to receive the Lord, just simply say, Jesus, I believe you are Lord. I believe you are Lord, and I believe that you died and that God has risen you from the grave. Because of which, because of Romans 10 and 9, if I confess that and believe that, I'm saved. Praise God. We want to celebrate you. Please visit our website if you receive salvation on tonight. You can go to our website and we can contact you and get more information and help you understand what that actually means. And then there are those you've already saved and you just need a ministry to be connected to. We want to make sure you're connected and united to the body of Christ. Become a member with Shallow Baptist Church, a disciple of the Shallow Baptist Church. Go to our website as well. More importantly, we just want to make sure you have salvation. We want to make sure you have that right relationship that God desires to have with you. That's the most important thing. And so again, thank you, Shallow Nation. Thanks for praying through these two nights, praying even through this whole entire season, and praying for everybody in this world that change might come. We're praying for change to come in all of our lives. Again, tomorrow night, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., we will be with Faith Encounters. Pastor Martin Pickett, Pastor of Faith Encounters, will be hosting us in their revival season on Wednesday night, 7 p.m. More information will come out about that as well. Make sure you mark the calendars. We've God has blessed us Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We'll be sharing in revival. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Shiloh. God bless you. May the Lord watch over and continue to keep you and grant you with peace all the days of your lives. In Jesus' name we pray and we all say amen. Love y'all. God bless you. See you soon.